Thanks, David. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is a, a real privilege to talk to this group, and especially uh, those of you like uh, Lisa who are on the front lines and, and um, really doing such important work, which uh, I, I appreciate. Uh, what I do want to talk about today is, is a bit of a change of pace, uh, talk about the minimum drinking age, uh, which certainly has some relationship to college drinking, uh, but, but is a much broader topic than that. Uh, and uh, what I'm doing, I think, is in a way speaking against type, uh, because I'm going to have um, favorable things to say about the possibility of reducing the minimum drinking age. Uh, but I got my start in researching this area uh, in 1978, appointed as a kind of an outsider to a National Academy of Sciences committee uh, that produced a book called uh, Alcohol and Public Policy Beyond the Shadow of Prohibition. But it was promptly dubbed by the alcohol industry as neo-prohibitionist. Uh, and I personally have had that rubric uh, many, many times from the Distilled Spirits Council and, and from the Wine Institute and other places like that. Um, uh, so despite the fact that I come to you as a neo-prohibitionist, uh, uh, I am going to um, have s some favorable things to say uh, about the minimum drinking age. And it is, in fact, uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, what, what I think is a, has been a settled issue for 25 years. Uh, what the surprise was the Amethyst uh, Initiative that uh, President Broadhead opened uh, this conference by talking about and about his experience in signing that petition along with about 135 other college presidents. Uh, there was quite an uh, outrage ex expressed at the time. Uh, and I think um, what we saw is that um, you know, that, that it was motivated um, by the somewhat quirky crusade uh, of John McArdle, the former president of Middlebury College. But what he was tapping into was a concern, I think, that is very widespread among college administrators about the hypocrisy of, on the one hand, being required to um, uh, say that they, they have a prohibitionist policy with respect to those who are under 21 on their campus. And on the other hand, the, the simple facts uh, that uh, we all know and, and have been presented at this conference, that well over 80% of underage college students, in fact, are, are drinking. So it becomes an, an issue for them st uh, to begin with as a, a matter of uh, hypocrisy. Uh, and beyond that as an issue of frustration in being able to figure out how to operate in this very um, controlled environment, legally controlled environment. All right. Uh, let me give you a brief history of the minimum legal uh, drinking age. Uh, it all starts in 1933 with the repeal of prohibition. Uh, most states, as they introduce their alcohol control laws, set 21 uh, as the minimum drinking age. Uh, if we flash forward to 1970, the Vietnam era, uh, the year that uh, we adopted the 26th Amendment to the Constitution that gave 18-year-olds the right to vote, it was the beginning of a cascade of changes in state law uh, that over half of them then reduced their age to 18 or 19 uh, during a very brief time. And, and by 1975, only 12 states were still at, at 21. Uh, that was good politics at the time, and it made sense given the, the draft, uh, the fact that young men were dying in, in, uh, in Vietnam for their country. It seemed absurd that they couldn't also um, drink for the, uh, if, when they came back. Uh, uh, but the consequence was uh, the observation that uh, as those states reduced their drinking age, it, in some cases it appeared that their highway fatality rate went up and that that was associated with those newly enfranchised um, uh, drinkers. And so that the, uh, some states then uh, reversed uh, and uh, President Reagan appointed the Volpe Commission which in 1984 sold Congress on the idea of establishing a national minimum drinking age of 21 uh, by dint of the influence of highway 
funds uh, which were to be withheld if states did not comply. And sure enough, by 1988, even Wyoming had complied and, and so that we had universal 21 as the minimum age. And that is to be understood, again, as entirely, entirely the result of a concern about highway safety. So that, that was the beginning and the end of the discussion. Lives were being lost on the highway uh, and the, the uh, older people didn't want to accept that uh, challenge or that, that threat. Uh, it was also true, of course, by 1984 that the Vietnam era was ended and the baby boon had all pretty much become 21 years old. So. <laughs> but I'm sure politics paid no part. All right. Uh, here's some of the kinds of evidence uh, that I was working on at the time uh, indicating that, in fact, um, the reductions in minimum drinking age did increase the highway fatality rate for those uh, involving uh, 18 to 20 year olds in particular. Uh, this is a very simple quasi-experimental uh, analysis that just looks, compares uh, the change in uh, the uh, uh, highway fatality rate for states that reduce their minimum drinking age with the states that stayed the same. Uh, and what you see here is the states that stayed the same and enjoyed a very large reduction in the highway fatality rate during that time, whereas the ones that uh, reduced their age did uh, about broke even. The reduction, incidentally, was the result of the Arab oil embargo and the 55 national speed limit. But if you take the difference, you find an 11% effect. So that's the, the kind of estimate that was coming out at, at the time that about the highway fatality rate for 18 to 20 year olds was 10 or 11% down as re, or up as a result of the reduction. Um, and there was very little change for the uh, other groups. Okay, so saves lives, good public health measure, uh, and that, that carried the day politically. Why now for amethyst and what has changed since 1984? One thing that's changed is that uh, during that period since 1984, drinking has gone down a good deal. It's gone down about 20% since the peak in 1980. Um, I remember what uh, the campus was like back in 1980. It was uh, as wet as it is today. It was far wetter then, both in drugs and, and alcohol. Uh, and we also uh, find that uh, youth drinking and related injuries had declined sharply during this period. Uh, and of course, from the point of view of the college presidents, they find themselves more controlled by federal legislation and by the legal framework than they were back then. So, so those are some of the things that would have motivated uh, the amethyst. And let me show you some of the data on the decline. For example, if you look at monitoring the future data, you can see what happened to the percent of high school seniors, the top line. Uh, starting in 1981, um, and it kinks downward in about 1987, actually after all of the states had come, complied with the 21, uh, and it, it starts uh, heading down uh, during that period and, and is a good deal lower, uh, around 50% compared with what it was in 1981, which is more like 70% of the 30-day prevalence for that group. Uh, maybe more to the point is to look at the, uh, what was happening with the driver fatality rate. Uh, and particularly, this is the diagram showing the percentage of uh, fatalities that involved a drinking driver uh, and a driver that had, uh, was in violation of the current per se laws, so 0.08%. Uh, and what you see is the blue line here showing a, a, sh a drop off for the 16 to 20 year olds during this period uh, from about 50% of fatalities involving uh, someone who was at 0.08 or higher down to around uh, 30%. And uh, there is also a decline that, that we see for the other age groups, although uh, not quite so dramatic. Uh, so this is all to say that, that there was um, a, a good deal of, of change in the right direction in terms of drinking and also in terms of youth drinking and driving. Uh, the overall effect on highway fatalities for the, uh, those under 21 and uh, the alcohol related fatalities went down from over 5,000 in the early 80s down to 2,000, uh, a, a really extraordinary change. 
Now, if you're going to say, well, what was happening during that period? The answer is a great many things were happening. Some of it is uh, owes to MAD, the Mothers Against Drunk Driving, and their efforts to establish per se laws and, and minimum penalties for drunk driving and a general change in the ethos around drunk driving that occurred during that period that, that saw it as a much more serious crime than had been true before. Some of it has to do with the fact that we did become a more temperate nation uh, starting in 1980 and general drinking declined uh, during, the, uh, during the 80s and into the early 90s. Some of it has to do with a uh, general increase in highway safety and the safety of cars. And some of it has to do with uh, youth-specific interventions, and especially, for example, the zero tolerance laws um, that said that if you're uh, underage, uh, then uh, you can lose your license even if you uh, just have had one drink be before driving. And now every state has, uh, as far as I know anyway, it's another one of those con congressional initiatives that has established this nationwide. That turns out to have been uh, effective at reducing drinking and driving, and it also has been effective, interestingly, in drinking and reducing drinking, just drinking, by, by uh, underage kids. Okay? So that's, you, you probably have your own favorite lists of things that changed during that period, but it is extraordinary when you look at it. If you look at, at how far we have come in terms of highway safety, if that's the focus for the minimum drinking age, the problem simply has a different magnitude, a different scope now than it did back in the days when the Volpe Commission was meeting and, and talking about this. Okay, let me give you uh, three perspectives on the minimum drinking age, uh, and uh, I think all of, all of them uh, are going to be familiar except uh, possibly the first one, which is on the public interest in, in a discussion of life versus liberty, um, which often uh, is not mentioned in the course of public health discussions, but I think it's appropriate uh, in thinking about the public interest to consider the liberty needs, uh, then a public health view, and then a policy design uh, view. So those will be the three, three views that I'll go over lightly. Um, uh, all of them, there's some things to be said about this that seem to favor a reduction in the minimum age. None of them, by any means, are decisive in, in that uh, discussion. All right. So in terms of life versus liberty, um, so we know that the minimum drinking age is saving lives. It, it is making a, a public health difference. There's actually other evidence that says it, it uh, is doing uh, other good things in, in terms of improving the uh, public health. But what we have to recognize is that, at least legally, uh, the 18 to 20 year olds these days are adults. I mean, the, the one thing that didn't change as a result of that 26th Amendment and all of the legal changes that went with it is that uh, 18 became established across the board as the age of adulthood for almost everything. Uh, so we have now decided, starting with the vote and holding public office, um, that 18-year-olds are indeed adults and full citizens of the, of the country. Uh, now, of course, more traditionally, they've been uh, able to serve in the military and, and to hold hazardous jobs. Uh, and in fact, in the early years, there was a draft. Uh, they can marry without consent and are no longer protected by statutory rape laws. Uh, they're tried as adult in criminal court in many states, including this one, at, uh, before age 18. Uh, they can drive without restrictions uh, if they have a license. They can sign contracts. Uh, they are uh, adult in that important sense. Of course, they can buy cigarettes legally and they can play the lottery in, in almost every state. Uh, and in most countries, they could drink legally. Uh, so this is the exception, although 19 in, in some Canadian provinces and a few other places. Uh, so that's, that's the case that says, like it or not, we have, in this country, adopted 18 as the age at which we declare these individuals uh, as adults. It's arbitrary. It could be uh, some other age. Um, and and uh, if we're raising our old ki own kids, we think maybe 40 is a better age. To, <laughs> um, but uh, legally, uh, and if we wanted to be consistent about this, it does certainly raise the question about why 
we have this one exception in this long list of very important and possibly self-damaging activities, uh, and that is uh, drinking. Okay. Now, one argument you could imagine along these lines would say, well, suppose that 18 to 20 year olds are, are just extraordinarily different than anybody else that we might consider to be an adult. Uh, then what? And uh, so one group you might compare them with is the 21 to 24 year olds. And what you find out with in terms of, for example, injury fatality rates is that they're very similar rather than different to that group. And that was true before uh, under other regimes in terms of the minimum drinking age also. Uh, but homicide rate is, uh, was the same in 2006 for uh, those under 21 and 21 and 24. The motor vehicle rate is about the same. In both cases, uh, a, a good deal higher than for those older than 24. Uh, no surprise there. But I think this is just to say that if you were going to start from a pure public health concern, um, there would be a lot of reason to set 25 as the minimum age rather than 21, just to, as the car rental companies have. Uh, and I, I think that it's true that, that the um, uh, studies of, of brain development also would favor 25 as, as an age. But that's not it. No one, no one is taking that seriously or ever has, uh, for whatever reason. Uh, as an economist, I'm interested in this question. It's also uh, a question that comes up a lot in federal uh, regulation uh, through the uh, Office of Management and the Budget. And that is, if we were starting from scratch uh, and Congress were talking about setting a minimum drinking age, would it pass the cost-benefit test? Uh, and uh, the, the, it turns out it matters a lot where you start with that question. But if you start by saying, well, we've declared 18-year-olds to be adults, that means they have standing. We have to consider their welfare and their own preferences, uh, as we have seen revealed in the marketplace, uh, the alcohol marketplace and, and other places. And so one of the issues then is if you did the cost-benefit test would be to say, gee, if we're going to take that right away from them, then we would have to compensate them. Uh, or at least it would, it would have to be true that there was so much surplus for the rest of society that they could fully compensate the 18 to 20 year olds and still come out ahead. Uh, so it's an interesting exercise to say, how much would you have to pay off 18 to 20 year olds to lose the right to drink legally? Now, of course, they're all out there drinking illegally. Um, but presumably they would rather have the, the choice of being able to drink in more civilized circumstances and, and to do it uh, without having the fake ID investment and all, all the rest of it. Um, and so that it would probably end up being billions of dollars by calculation that I have along there. All right. So that's the first thing is this general discussion about uh, the rights uh, and, and the, the trade-off between life and liberty. Obviously, the fact that the minimum drinking age saves lives does not end the argument. We, we have chosen to uh, do away with national prohibition, even though that saved lives. We don't set the minimum drinking age at 25, even though that would save lives of a group that is very dangerous. Um, and uh, why, why don't we have the conversation as if 18-year-olds really were adults, and I think we might come out with a different conclusion. Okay, a second framework in which to discuss this is from the public health perspective. Um, and I think that's an interesting one because um, it, it actually is useful regardless of whether we change the minimum age or not. Uh, the perspective would say, uh, take the population-based uh, approach and say, are the 18 to 20 year olds really a distinct group in this conversation? Or are they part of the larger population? Well, statistically, in, in many comparisons that we could do, they look like their drinking choices are actually closely related to uh, drinking of the entire population. Here's just one example uh, along those lines. The red line here is national uh, ethanol, apparent ethanol consumption per capita. So it's based on the excise and sales data uh, that the NIAAA keeps. 
And you can see um, it's on this scale here, a pure ethanol gallons per, per year. It bottomed out um, in the mid-1990s and has been creeping up since then. And it matches uh, very well against college binge drinking data from monitoring the future during that same time. If you look at the two-week prevalence of having five drinks or, or more during this period. So this, this is just one example. You can, I can show you lots of others that suggests that whatever it is that the kids are doing and the young adults are doing, 18 to 20, uh, seems to be heavily influenced by the question about what everybody else is doing. And that's not a surprise. Uh, that's what we expect. Uh, I was part of this panel that reported out in 2004 from the National Academy of Sciences, and that was the perspective that it took that to reduce underage drinking, we should be thinking about the population drinking and, and what to do at that level. One thing that we recommended is to raise the alcohol tax. Uh, that got all of the attention from that report because the industry went off on us uh, saying, what on earth are you talking about? Um, but uh, the fact is that we have very good evidence that raising the alcohol tax does reduce um, uh, alcohol abuse and the consequences thereof. Uh, and that, uh, in fact, our national policy towards uh, alcohol control uh, since 1990 has been to make it alcohol more available. Uh, it's done it by implicitly allowing the alcohol tax, the federal alcohol taxes, to erode during this time due to inflation. If we were to restore them to the 1991 level, it would require a 62% uh, increase. If we were going to restore them to the 1960 level, we would, for example, have a federal tax of $1.20 per six pack instead of 33 cents. And that's just holding even. It's not even uh, doing it. So uh, this, this is the kind of thing that we were talking about. It would make a big difference, not only for the population as a whole, but also for use. All right, and finally is the policy design issue and what can we do uh, there. National prohibition, just as a bit of history, was a, a failure not in the, in the sense that it didn't reduce drinking and save lives, it was a failure because it was widely violated. It produced a lot of cynicism because there was a lot of public ambivalence that led to lax enforcement and some corruption. Uh, and because it produced a, a violent underground economy uh, during the period. Those first two look pretty familiar if you're thinking about underage drinking under our current regime. The third doesn't happen because it's impossible to monopolize the sale to kids uh, along the way or to use. Um, if we had repeal uh, as, well, when we had repeal in 1933, the result, interestingly enough, was much more systematic enforcement than we had had during the 1920s and a real effort to, to collect those taxes that suddenly became available, uh, a lot less corruption. And so that that's suggestive of what we might be able to do. The other thing that I would say uh, in this policy design issue, I don't know what would happen if we lowered the minimum drinking age. I don't know what should be done exactly on college campuses. Uh, uh, I certainly like what I've been hearing, and I like what Bob was saying this morning, and so forth. But here's the more general point, is that by having prohibition for 18 to 20 year olds, we've lost our ability to experiment, to try things, to do everything um, that we could in a systematic way to produce evidence-based policies uh, around alcohol control. Uh, I became fascinated when I was doing research for my book by a book that was commissioned by uh, one of the Rockefellers back in 1933 by Fosdick and Scott saying, what should we do now that we have repeal? And one of the things that uh, they emphasized was that the 48 states constitute a social science laboratory uh, in which different ideas and methods can be tested. And the exchange of experience will be infinitely valuable for the future. Well, not only is that true for the 48 states, but it, it's also true potentially for the thousands of college campuses that we have around the, camp, you know, the country. Right now, we can't do that kind of experimentation because we're prohibited by federal law. Okay, now, you know, the fact is that we're not going to repeal the minimum age or lower it anytime soon. Uh, I think this is a non-starter. Even the Tea Party is not interested in this particular form of tyranny. Uh, so uh, it, it still is interesting to say, well, you know, are there halfway measures or partial measures? What else should be on the table? 
Uh, and let me just suggest um, that we might, in some states, consider carve-outs. Um, most outrageously to me is the law bans families from allowing uh, youths to drink, uh, even under the supervision of the, of the adults. Uh, but there are other institutions that have res uh, authority over, over youth, such as what? Residential schools and military reservations. Uh, and so we could say, well, the, let's suspend uh, or modify the minimum age, at least in those controlled circumstances, and, and uh, see what happens. It's interesting, actually, there is a provision for suspension. A base commandant in the military can announce that this will be a day when 18-year-olds can drink. For example, if there's a unit that has just come back from the front and there's a celebration, then they can do that. Ordinarily, they have to stay with 21 as their minimum age. And of course, we have a variety of, of mixed possibilities. Uh, and finally, let, let me just say, I am uh, very um, intrigued by the, by the zero tolerance laws and convinced that they're super effective. And I think that they would not need to go by the wayside even if we did reduce the minimum drinking age. So that our ability to re regulate in, is not restricted by a change in the minimum drinking age. Quite the contrary, I think it opens up in, in a, a useful way. So thanks very much.